think it depends on where you are. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is our Ask Us uh, first uh, dialogue with uh, Editor Series Talk. All right. So a brief introduction about, well, my name is Zhi Wei Zhang. I work as an associate professor at Kansas State University. So uh, I'll be your moderator today. So, so first, I will give a really brief introduction about our the ASPAS mission, all right? American Society for Public Administration's primary function is to serve as the critical bridge between the public administration scholarship and practitioners in the field. All of our services and programs are geared towards supporting our society's goal to advance the art, science, teaching, and practice of public and nonprofit administration. All right, so uh, as today's talk, like, uh, like we had a uh, brief in, uh, uh, conversation with Elin earlier, this is a public service talk. So uh, uh, we're, all, we're open to, to everybody, but at the meantime, I want, to, uh, I want to say a couple words about our section, section on Chinese public administration. All right, we were established in uh, April 2006 and consists of scholars and practitioners from the uh, US, China, and other countries. All right, so it is the, uh, the largest professional and scholarly organization in the field of Chinese public administration and public affairs in the US. All right, so the, uh, the, the most uh, important uh, announcement that I'm going to make today is our most critical person, Han Jin, uh, is going to send out a link to, to show you how to uh, register for the uh, SC, SCPA membership if you're interested, all right? So that's, um, that's, uh, that's all the commercial for today. All right, before I turn the floor to Yelin uh, Lu, I will make a couple announcements uh, about how we are going to proceed for today's, uh, today's uh, talk, all right? So I uh, mentioned this earlier, you entered Zoom muted by default. So please only unmute yourself when you have questions, all right? So like, uh, like any other talk, we want to keep our questions toward the, uh, toward the end of the talk uh, in the Q&A section, all right? So you are allowed to ask for clarification questions when Jeremy is talking. And in the Q&A section, there should be a raise your hand function there, all right? So uh, if you want to ask a question, we would appreciate if you raise your hand first, all right? That's it. Uh, do we have any questions? All right, I'll turn the floor to Elaine. Thank you, thank you, Zhi Wei. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Elaine Lu. I am a professor and a director at the City University of New York. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this uh, SCPA dialogue series. You know, to me, uh, as the elected section chair. I see the mission of the section as connecting people to study public administration, focusing on the greater China region, as well as comparatively across the globe. So to many of us, you know, research and publication is not only, you know, publish or perish a kind of a pressure, but instead they are in our DNA. So today we are pleased to have a professor Jeremy Howe with us. He is, as many of you know, the editor-in-chief of Public Administration Review, one of the flagship journals in our field. I do not know about you, but I am very, very excited about the sharing that will be taking place right now in this virtual room. So he will be sharing with us his research and the thoughts on publications, as you can see all those detailed notes on the screen. So I'm very excited. And uh, without further ado, Professor Howe, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's an honor to join your section this evening for this talk. Uh, I appreciate the invitation and I hope that um, this gives you an opportunity to both get my perspective on things that are happening in the field and the literature in particular, but also some things that are happening with PAR and um, I hope this is a beneficial exercise for all of you. I will ask for you know, your understanding. My eyes have, <laughs> have uh, developed some sort of an allergic reaction just as I sat down at the screen. So if I keep messing with my glasses, I don't mean to distract. I'm just uh, trying to cope with the, the reality of, uh, of physiology, I suppose. Um, so I am, of course, editor-in-chief of PAR. And I'm a professor of public administration at the University of Central Florida, where I also direct a PhD program in public affairs. And so I, what I want to do this evening is talk broadly about the trends that are occurring in 
in PA research. And the things that I see as editor of PAR, uh, be they uh, sort of broad scale trends that are occurring over a long period of time or sort of shorter wave trends that are um, here today, gone tomorrow sorts of things. Uh, and, and give you my perspective on where this is going and where the field is headed, um, at least in the short term. So I have three more years as editor of PAR, and um, I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about the things that I'm doing as editor and the things that we're doing with the journal in terms of our features, uh, symposia that we have uh, put out, and the way that we try to share information about PAR articles toward the end of the talk. And I hope that uh, we can use the question and answer session to address any concerns or questions that you might have. So I think with that, I'd like to get into the material. And you know, the first thing that we really have to think about in PA research, if you look at the broad trends uh, over time, there's really been a very strong movement toward um, higher standards in general, but also increasing standards for validity and reliability in the research that we publish. Now, this is not just true of PAR, this is true of, of all the journals. Um, as ASPA's flagship journal, PAR has to, uh, has to set the standard. We, uh, we are the standard bearer among the PA generalist journals. And you know the, the uh, specialization journals and the section journals tend to follow suit when uh, when PAR raises its standards, by default, all the other journals raise their standards as well. Uh, in part because, uh, you know, if it's harder to get into PAR, people are trying harder and the quality of research is increasing across the, uh, across the plane. Uh, and that means that when PAR rejects something, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, that the quality of the submissions that are going to other journals uh, is that much better. So. As a field, we are working to uh, increase sophistication in methodology, uh, research methodology and approaches. We have made significant quantitative and qualitative advancements. Um, I will be honest with you, uh, in the first three years I served as a Taglio, uh, we saw a variety of very interesting manuscripts using a variety of very interesting methodologies. And the fun part is that some of them we hadn't heard of before uh, because they were used in fields that were outside our specialties. And so we had to uh, learn about these methodologies before we could even make a determination about what to do with the manuscripts. Uh, and so one that comes to mind is Q methodology, which is uh, on the qualitative side. And uh, so we, uh, we got to know a little bit about that. We've published a couple of articles that used it. So, um, Lots of advances, lots of new techniques, lots of trying new things. Of course, um, you know, on the quantitative side, there have been a, a host of advancements as well. In particular, we've seen a, a very strong rise in the use of experimental and quasi-experimental designs in the field. Um, and the benefit, of course, of gold standard research, uh, the experimental design, is that you have a control group and it helps to explain away all of the random error that you might have. And so there are a variety of these. We, we see not just pure experiments, uh, but like I said, quasi-experiments. Uh, we've published a few papers that use survey experiments. And so there are a lot of different ways of approaching this subject, but uh, you know, that's, that's the biggest development that I would say I see on the quantitative side. All of that work has been fueled in large part by the uh, behavioral public administration movement, the, the effort to uh, use behavioral economics to, to better understand the way decisions are made and the way people respond to cues and, um, and the way bias influences decisions. Uh, measuring those things has, has got to be very sophisticated in order to capture the effects. And so the methodology has followed suit. Um, all of this means that um, the top journals like PAR in the field have to look at papers and the extent to which they really move that conceptual needle forward. Uh, if, if things are, are just sitting still and if a piece that we receive doesn't really advance our understanding or advance knowledge or advance the way we understand something or the way we investigate it, uh, then there's not really anything new or beneficial about it. So uh, a, a piece that we look at that say comes in and we review it and it has an innovative methodology 
that looks at an existing question that helps us to better understand theory uh, and, and contributes to theory in a meaningful way, that's something that PAR is interested in. And so all of these advancements have, have led us in that direction. I'll give you another example of an interesting technique that we saw used. Um, there was a paper, uh, actually, I knew the author personally. Uh, he was a former colleague. And this was in probably first or second year that we were editing. And the paper came in and this particular person was studying the difference in public sector decision makers and private sector decision makers and actually used functional MRI scans of the brain during decision exercises. Now that's not something you see every day in our journals, but uh, they had actually measured and mapped and documented a physiological response that could be captured with MRI imaging, uh, functional MRI imaging. Mm -hmm. And a very interesting paper, not very easy to find a reviewer to consider, but we did actually find a medical doctor who used uh, MRIs in, in uh, his research to, to review the piece. Uh, I don't think it's ever been revised uh, and resubmitted, but, uh, but we invited it to be revised. So anytime we see something very novel and innovative, we're, we're interested. And I think that's true of all of the journals. When we see those kinds of, of novel methodologies employed that, that advance our thinking and understanding in the field, we're always excited to see those. And we have high hopes for them in the review process. Uh, so as we, as we look at papers that advance theory, that contribute to the conceptual basis in the field. Um, we, we wanna see things that are using methods that are valid and reliable. And if there's a question about validity or if there's a question about reliability that stems from the methods, that's one of the first things that reviewers are going to, to pinpoint and criticize. Um, and you know, in order to, to publish things in PAR, we, we definitely have uh, very strong considerations in that area. So it's one thing to be interesting as a research question. Uh, it's another thing to use a novel research methodology. But if we don't have very firm um, um, understanding of the way things were done and confidence in the validity and reliability, it's very difficult to move forward. So that has implications for other kinds of research methods, doesn't it? Let's say here that the corollary is uh, a shift in our thinking as a field that makes it more and more difficult to justify papers that use more simplistic methodologies. It's more difficult to justify survey research. Um, hey, I do survey research, so don't, don't think I'm criticizing uh, your approaches or, um, or, or approaches in general. I'm just uh, stating what I view as a fact. Um, you know, survey research is more difficult to justify. Simple cross-sectional analysis is more difficult to justify. Um, so the, the more advanced your data set, the more observations you have, the more units of time that are included, uh, you know, when you have panel data and, and the more sophisticated your methodology, the more, I would say, the greater the likelihood that it will uh, withstand peer review. Um, now, I have to say that it doesn't mean we don't look at pieces that use those kinds of research. What it does mean is, and this is part G, where I talk about how PAR has handled this issue. Well, PAR has looked at this shift in methodologies by focusing on the contribution of each manuscript to the literature in which it is situated. So what I mean is a piece comes in and we look at it and we look at the methodology that's, that's applied in that piece. And, and we then think about how it fits with the literature in that area of research. So it's public management or for performance management or human resource management, whatever the case may be, we look at the body of knowledge in that field and we look at this piece and we say, is this on par with what's happening in that field? Is this cutting edge thinking? Is this a cutting edge methodology or has this already been done? And so that's really the way we think about it. The, the research methodology just needs to match the question that's being asked. In other words, it needs to be appropriate for the research question you've got in your paper, but it also needs to be um, considerate of the level of sophistication that's taking place in that field in, in general. So there are definitely cases where good qualitative research contributes to our understanding, and we applaud those, those efforts. There are cases where 
uh, it really needs to be uh, very sophisticated, even experimental designs to contribute to knowledge. In other words, questions have been asked and addressed using a variety of quantitative methodologies already. It takes something pretty interesting, pretty novel to justify PAR considering something. I'm using PAR as an example because it's the journal I'm working with every day. But these, I think these, these trends um, are true of all of our journals. So, you know, the, the, the question really depends, well, the research methodology depends on the question and the conceptual area that it's contributing to. All of these things in terms of the, the research methods, I think have brought PAR much, excuse me, not PAR, but have brought PA much more in line with the traditional hard sciences. Uh, as we see you know, the use of control groups to rule out uh, plausible alternative explanations, uh, the, you know, the confidence in our findings is increasing. And of course, the, um, the world can look at the, the articles that we publish in our journals and have confidence in those findings and look to them to understand the phenomena that are taking place and hopefully use our findings to reshape the way that decisions are made and the way policies are made to influence outcomes. Um, so I think the other, the other side of this coin, you know, we're talking about trends in public administration research. There are topical trends, there are methodological trends, and then there are frankly administrative trends. And in part H, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, so we also have uh, new expectations that researchers will make their data available on public sharing sites, that they will share the details of their methodology, including the code that they use, the statistical code for their software program, uh, when things are accepted for publication. Uh, we expect that authors will disclose conflicts of interest uh, when they submit articles. And so if the research was funded by an interested party, that obviously is a problem and it should be disclosed. It doesn't mean we wouldn't publish the research. It just means we need to take certain actions to ensure validity um, and, and, and an absence of bias. Um, of course, research ethics is becoming a very important topic as well. Um, we, we have seen in other disciplines examples of really tragic mistakes where data sets have been um, artificially created and mined to produce results that were of interest. Uh, think of the East Anglia University con uh, controversy with climate, uh, climate change a few years back uh, as, as an example of that. So research ethics and the way that we conduct research with the IRBs and human subjects and, and the whole host of ethical issues uh, really has become much more central to our field and the way that we, uh, the way that we think about research. Then of course, um, there are new concerns. I mean, they're longstanding concerns, but there are newly revisited concerns about academic bullying and the relationship between faculty mentors and students and things like that that have to be taken into consideration. And of course, we don't ever want to see um, uh, academic dishonesty or research uh, integrity compromised because of personal relationships. So all sorts of things that are influencing the field and the way we conduct research. Um, turning to, to section B here as, as the next broad trend, one of the things that we, I think, are seeing is, as a field in public administration, is much stronger emphasis on the bodies of theory that we look to and contribute to, uh, and the relevance of the research questions to that body of theory. I often tell groups, when I'm, when I'm giving editors talks about the journal itself, that in order to appear in par, an article has to appeal to the conceptual foundation in an important way. It has to be practically significant to this, this body of knowledge. Uh, it has to add something meaningful. It also has to appeal to a readership that's broader than just the people who are doing research in that area, because par is a broad journal. It's a generalist journal. We have a global audience. Uh, we have scholars around the world who look to uh, PAR articles for knowledge and understanding. And our readership is, you know, they don't just select an article or two. They look to PAR for what's, what's the latest research in the field. Um, so much, much, much stronger and increasing focus on the conceptual contribution of articles. 
Now, if I say the emphasis on conceptual contribution is increasing, what does that mean? It means that something must be decreasing in my mind, right? Well, what I'm really trying to say is that um, in the past, it's been enough to pick something of practical interest. You know, PAR is a journal that appeals not only to researchers, but also to practitioners. We're one of the only journals that has that as part of our core mission. And so when we think about the appeal to practice, um, it's now more important that the pieces we publish uh, advance that conceptual area while still contributing to practice. So I guess what I'm saying is that, well, practice is still a central part of our mission and we're still interested in things that describe and discuss current practice or innovative practices or ch changes that have occurred in practice. Um, those things don't get published unless it's very clear that they are drawn from the body of theory that's well understood and accepted and that they contribute to it. So a very strong emphasis on the conceptual contribution of pieces now. Um, so I guess, you know, what I say here is an interesting research question necessary it's not enough the piece really has to be original it has to be novel and have conceptual relevance to the existing body theory um part c i think this is a trend that wouldn't surprise anyone uh, i say it's a long trend it's one of those long cyclical trends that's been taking place for quite a while and continuing the long trend focusing on the softer side of public administration continues what do i mean by the softer side well people more than institutions uh, getting out of the rigid framework and the structural analyses and looking more at those informal relationships and the decisions of individuals and networks and collaborations. So looking more at people and their attributes and their contributions to governance. You know, you could look at any of hundreds of articles that address public service motivation. In my own research, you know, I, I am a scholar in the field of evidence-based practice primarily also performance management. But in my own research, you know, I've, I've started looking less at the institutional side and more at the personal side. So a few, a few years back, I uh, did a study with Ed Jennings where we looked at state agency use of decision-making. Well, again, that was an institutional perspective. Well, that's actually published in JPART. Um, that's an institutional perspective on the way information is used and processed and entered into decisions agency decisions. Uh, subsequent work that I've done with Greg Van Risen and others uh, looks at, uh, this one was published in PAR, the most recent one, uh, looks at norms of evidence and research and decision making. Well, norms are informal. Norms are a shared understanding that's, you know, at a personal level with the people who are working in that organization. So it's not really an institutional perspective, mm -hmm. even though I'm using institutions or agencies as, as sort of the, the focus of the observations, it's the people and the way they view the culture in their agencies that I'm interested in. So I use my own research as an example here, uh, but the, the focus is much more on the softer side. And this makes behavioral PA all the more relevant because those nudges that we can put in place shape the way people respond and react. Uh, the heuristics that people use in making decisions determine the outcomes. Whether someone shifts from system one thinking to system two thinking, uh, moves from intuitive to rational, uh, decision-making processes affects outcomes. So we start to see much, much more about the relevance of the individual working within the organizations and the interplay between, uh, again, we don't, exclude the formal side, but we focus more on the informal side at the interactions among agencies, uh, organizations, collaboratives, partnerships, networks, and research in all of those areas continues to bear fruit. Uh, we, we see lots and lots and lots of manuscripts come in that focus on the way agencies get things done uh, through these unique modern mechanisms. Uh, government has to be more responsive, more flexible to address those sorts of concerns uh, than it ever had. So I think of, of those as, as long trends. Uh, you would recognize that it's the shift from government to governance uh, and the rise of collaboration and co-production as objects of research, uh, focusing not only on governments, but on nonprofit organizations, 
quasi-governmental organizations, and again, networks, partnerships, and all sorts of modern organizational forms that uh, are uniquely shaped to respond to problems. Um, thinking on uh, to part D here, comparative work. We, and in, in a few minutes, I'll point you back to some of the things we've done over the last few years in PAR and some of the things we're still doing. Um, we just published in this issue um, a symposium on global, global PA, global public administration. It's not got a lot of pieces in it because um, uh, most of the pieces didn't survive the review process, which is typical of PAR. Um, we reject a lot. So it makes a, a symposium a very difficult thing to put together. But the, uh, the idea was that we wanted to stimulate more comparative research in the field. And it gives you an example across uh, a variety of topics how we can look at, from a comparative perspective, the way things happen in different regions, uh, in different countries, in different states, um, in different provinces, and learn. You know, it, it's the results are not always different, even though the processes are the same uh, or appear to be the same. And some of the pieces in that symposium have focused, for example, on cultural differences at the local level. Uh, different understandings, different shared perceptions. Uh, it's kind of sort of a social construction of reality perspective. And so comparative work, I think, is one of the next great opportunities for our field to look at how things are different from place to place. You know, studies over time have, uh, have done a pretty good job of classifying regions of the world and comparing them. You know, we, we talk about the individualism in the West and the collectivism in the global East. Uh, we talk about the developed world in the North, and the undeveloped or underdeveloped world in the South, uh, global South. Uh, you know, those are broad distinctions, but those are relevant and important. Um, you know, this is a, a group that's uh, focused on Chinese public administrators and Chinese public administration. And, you know, I'm very cognizant of the fact that there's a lot of great scholarship going on in China because I receive a lot of it at par. Um, the, the challenge is to figure out what is interesting from China that is of appeal to the rest of the world. And comparative research or research that draws those comparative linkages uh, really helps to sell any particular piece to the reviewers and to the, to the potential future audience um, in ways that a simple study uh, might not. And we have some very savvy reviewers. Um, you know, I, I work very hard to find good reviewers for, for manuscripts that we receive. And I just recently had a, a piece that focused on, uh, on China, where the reviewer pointed out something uh, that they knew about the way things were done in China and, um, and wondered why the author hadn't, hadn't brought, brought it up in the piece. Um, I don't want to share too much because I don't want to disclose uh, details about a manuscript, but um, but it's one of those things that, you know, they had studied this aspect of China, the reviewer had, I, I gather, to better understand something and, and learn how things work. And I think it's very valuable when we can look at the world, and look at our, our similarities and our differences, and draw from those in a way that adds to that core body of theory. So what would, I, what would I say? I would say that if we look at something broad like public management, performance management, there are, there are parts of the theory in those fields that apply everywhere. And there are parts that are unique. Uh, the results are unique or the relationships are unique depending on where you're measuring it, uh, what the conditions are like, what the local environment and the context are like. So comparative work is, is an area that provides a lot of future opportunity. Uh, in my mind, and, and there are there are authors who are out there doing it. Uh, I think more so they are people who are in Europe looking across European nations, or they are people in um, countries other than the U.S. I would say, where uh, work is work is developing. To to again, this is across a variety of very interesting questions. Um, part E: globalization and the global PA community. It's not unrelated to the work on, on comparative stuff. 
But I think we're seeing increasingly that the problems we face as human society transcend the boundaries of any region, any state, any country, any city, uh, at least many of them do. And if we look at the kinds of problems the world faces and the kinds of policies that are going to have to be in place moving forward, globalization is, is one of those features that we have to, to make more prominent in the research that we do. Um, just in the way of you know thinking climate change is an obvious example, uh, patterns of global migration. Migration. The COVID-19 pandemic uh, is an example because they, you know, it, it took no time for it to become a global, uh, a global concern. And those those things show how we're very much alike, no matter where we're from and and, and what we're doing. And you look at other things. Well, what's technology doing? Well, uh, technology is a global, uh, a, a really a global topic. Uh, whether we're putting satellites in space to provide broadband internet to underserved parts of the world, or whether we're developing plans to explore other planets, and there's a lot of global cl uh, collaboration and, and frankly, policies that are going to have to be looked at on a global scale as we, as we clutter up our atmosphere uh, and as we begin to leave this planet and move to other places and look around, whether it's the moon or Mars or, or whatever. So... You know, global problems require global understanding. And again, some of that comes from comparative work, but some of it comes from finding ways, again, that long cycle of moving from government to governance, finding ways to do things outside the accepted boundaries. Um, uh, part F, PA has interdisciplinary traditions, but I feel the, the discipline has really solidified in meaningful ways as a discipline on its own. And so I think we continue to, to take interest in ideas from other fields, whether it's sociology, economics, political science, um, you know, even the hard sciences, sometimes we draw metaphors from them. Uh, whatever the case may be, we are always open to ideas. We're always interested in learning how different perspectives could shape the way we understand something. PA has those kinds of strong interdisciplinary traditions. And, you know, we don't see a lot of, of manuscripts submitted from interdisciplinary teams. We see a, a lot of co-authored manuscripts, but, um, but usually those are all PA scholars. And to me, that's a signal that, that the discipline has solidified around its own body of theory, its own journals, its own, um, departments and, and agencies and, and various foci conceptually. So in terms of, you know, broad trends, I think that's one that we can't overlook. And then part G, I call them topics of the day. We have long cycle trends and then we have short cycle trends. And it's sometimes difficult to distinguish which they are. So for example, we've had in the United States, we had Trump. Uh, populist president and people are interested in populism and the effect that it has on leadership and policy and um, you know administrative responses uh, we just ran a piece in par on administrative trumpism by don Mo uh, moynihan and uh, al roberts and uh, you know it's a very interesting piece um, i just just got an inquiry from you know, someone in mexico who says hey we have a populist leader in mexico too and we're looking at uh, sending you something on this topic as well. So, you know, populism is a political phenomenon, but public administration happens within the scope of politics and policy. So uh, it has its own staying power. It's, it's, it's still the fourth, <laughs> the fourth sector of government, but, um, you know, we can't ignore the effect that political change is having on the administration. I think that's a good example. Uh, of course, COVID-19 created a short-term cycle, short-term opportunity. I fully expect we will see manuscripts that explore uh, the COVID-19 pandemic for years to come because governments are going to be adapting and responding to it for years to come. They're going to be recovering, uh, changing in important ways because they learn from it. And as practice 
reveals novel ideas and innovations. Scholarship studies them and, and presents the more effective among them. So, you know, I'm, I'm not blind to the fact that COVID-19 is going to shape a lot of the research that we continue to see. Um, I'm, not, I'm not as interested now as I was last summer in the direct responses to COVID-19 as an editor. But as an editor, I, I'm very much aware that COVID-19 changed the world. It changed the way that things are done. And I'm still very much interested in scholarship that looks at um, you know, a, a core body of theory with an eye toward understanding how COVID-19 changed it and, and learning from it. You know, how does a disaster affect uh, the way we practice X, Y, or Z? It's not unlike a hurricane um, for a city or a state. So in this case, COVID-19, of course, affected the whole world and as many different governments and practices and processes as there are out there, uh, there are potential studies. And so, you know, it, it's in the bigger picture, it's a short-term trend, but it's, it's got a little staying power. And then social equity, you know, this is an example of a topic that is probably a lot more important in some places than others, but we can't ignore it. And certainly the, the United States PA community is not ignoring it. So um, we had, you know, race riots in the United States all, all summer last year and into the fall. And I guess to some extent they're still going on following a, a couple of examples of police brutality, uh, which of course are condemnable, but um, you know, the way that we view race and the way that race interacts with politics and policy and the administration, that's a very important issue in the United States. Uh, it may not be as important in China, but we have to, we, you know, we can't ignore that. And we have to think about how social equity concerns might affect different groups differently, different nations differently, different regions differently. It's an issue that is continuing to garner a lot of attention uh, on the US side. Uh, and to that end, you know, if you look at things that we've done under my editorship at PAR, we did a symposium on the Me Too movement uh, last year. We did a symposium on uh, civil rights uh, that published recently. And currently we have under review about 40 manuscripts that hope to be part of a symposium on um, gender and race social equity concerns. So, you know, the, um, you can look at the things that we're sort of leading research on to get an idea of what we think the important topics are. Uh, we've had I'm going to skip ahead a little bit to number seven right below here, but if you look at what we published, I just named three of those. We had a symposium on behavioral public administration a year ago. We, in this issue, we have one on global public administration. We did one on entrepreneurial PA. We have one in the works on branding uh, in government. Uh, the most recent call for papers we issued is on performance management. Um, well, Carmina Bianchi in Italy is, is leading the charge on that one. And that's something that, you know, we think is, it deserves a new look. And so we're always interested in proposals. We're always interested in the, the next great topic. But uh, at the end of the day, we're trying to appeal to the, the broad audience that PAR faces. So I think you know, to go back up the list now to number one, I say areas for future opportunities and gaps. I've talked a lot about the trends that have been taking place. And my knowledge of those trends is based in large part on the, on the focus of the manuscripts that I receive every day. And I get a lot of manuscripts. I'll talk about that in a minute. But I think there is growth in fields of practice that have not seen commensurate growth in research. And you know, I'd like to point out the ones that I see because these are areas where uh, I think there's room for growth in scholarship and Certainly in PAR, I would make room for topics, um, for, for articles on these topics as appropriate. Uh, one is artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, if, if you've been following <laughs> the, the things that are taking place in the United States, you know, we talk about big data, we talk about machine learning and algorithmic decision making. Um, we're relying more and more on computers and by default, the people who program them. Computers don't 
make decisions on their own. They are they do what they're told. Um, but machines can learn. They can take vast amounts of information and analyze it and make predictive uh, decisions and, and predict behaviors and other things. And governments are increasingly using technology for a variety of purposes. I think, you know, from a, a, a very basic democratic standpoint, we have considerations and concerns in the United States that stem from the concentration of power in the hands of a few corporations. Uh, we, we saw during the last presidential election how, for example, Twitter uh, shut down President Trump's account uh, during the campaign. Maybe it was right after the campaign um, and election. But, you know, you, you have a company changing, changing speech. And again, the U.S. Uh, situation is different than other places around the world. But then you look at Amazon, Amazon.com, corporate global giant, uh, purveyor of merchandise and digital media, deciding to pull certain books from the shelf, uh, the, the virtual shelf, pulling them from sale. And so, you know, there are a lot of things that are taking place in the technology world, the artificial intelligence world, machine learning that I think deserve our attention. And as governments become more sophisticated and use these techniques, scholarship needs to keep up. Um, I think number, number two is related. Technology has important effects on the traditional roles that we see for government and government uh, bureaucrats, public managers, such as accountability, power, and control. And as technology changes those things, somebody needs to be looking at it. Uh, so if the government has the ability to make information disappear, then what difference does it make if there's a sunshine law that requires them to reveal it? They can just delete it and it's gone. Uh, then the sunshine law is of no, of no benefit. So I think we have to rethink a lot of what I would call well understood principles and relationships on the basis of te technological innovation and advances. Uh, one of the things that I am perplexed by is the absence of research that looks at rural and non-metropolitan management and policy. Um, why not? Why, why don't we see it? Because you can't get data. It's difficult to research uh, things that happen in rural areas because there are very few data points. Uh, you know, in the U.S. case, the census doesn't collect or doesn't report data on cities uh, at the same level you know, small cities at the same level that it does large cities. And so there are st statistical errors uh, that have to be taken into account. And you just don't see the same level of knowledge and understanding. I think that's very important because, you know, public services are delivered in metropolitan areas, but they're also delivered in non-metropolitan areas. And the experience of stakeholders and citizens in, in those different settings can be vastly different. Um, and I think we need to understand that better. Uh, I, my, my heart is on the side of, of rural towns and non-metropolitan areas because that describes the area where I grew up uh, as a child. I've never been a city person per se. And, and so it's, it's a personal interest, but I think if you look at the contents of our journals, you don't see a lot of studies that look at uh, rural or, or low population areas. And of course, there's a capacity gap there as well. Uh, it's, it's, they have a capacity gap, a capacity deficit, and the economy of scale is working against them in most areas of public service, whether it be law enforcement or transportation. So that's something that I think we, we should consider. I uh, mentioned earlier, and I'll mention it again, uh, area for, for potential research is mass migration, uh, migration in general, and the effects that it has on, on the administration. We see you know, waves of people moving from Africa into Europe, at least prior to COVID-19 and at the beginning of the pandemic. We see now uh, with the change in administration in the U.S., we see um, caravans of migrants moving north from Latin America, South America, to the U.S. southern border and into the United States. Um, these people have different cultural expectations, different socioeconomic characteristics, and the, the choice of where they locate uh, is going to have profound impacts on the cities and non-metropolitan areas, potentially, uh, that have to deliver services to them. You know, obviously, one of the key concerns is language and the ability to provide uh, common services. 
what else? Um, Evidence-based practice. If you look at politics and policy, especially in the Western world, I'm not as familiar with what's going on in Asia or Africa, but if you look at the United States, Canada, Western Europe in particular, Australia, there is a considerable amount of focus on evidence-based practice, evidence-based decision-making, evidence-based policy uh, at, from the beginning of the COVID pandemic through the present. Uh, we've heard nothing but follow the science, follow the science. And that's really what evidence-based practice is about. It's about identifying what, what works, implementing it in advance, and, and using it to, to ward off bad performance or, or negative effects. Um, there were, I mean, I'm one of them. There are just not very many people that are looking at this explicitly. And I think there's a tremendous potential because the term is so widely used. We need to understand it better. We need to better understand why politicians are using the term and the context in which it's used and what they mean by it. Uh, I think that's a good starting point because I don't think there's a lot of clarity there. Uh, and you know, if we're not talking about the same thing, if we're really comparing apples to oranges, then it, it becomes a challenge to uh, say whether or not it was effective or ineffective, uh, whether it's a trend that should continue. Um, other things, what are we interested in in PAR? There's still a need for integrative literature reviews and meta-analyses, um, studies of studies that aggregate findings and try to make sense of relationships that have been studied for a long time. You know, as we continue to compile a body of literature, uh, we have more opportunities, more observations to compile and, and reflect on. I think you know, defining some of those central questions and concerns um, leaves open the opportunity for, for good literature reviews with meta-analytical meta findings. Um, and so, you know, I just kind of like to, to leave it there in terms of the trends the research trends as I see them and talk a little bit about PAR and I'll go through this quickly um, so that there's more time for questions. But, uh, you know, I want you to know that um, what we do and how we, how we run things and, um, so that you have a good sense of the journal and, and how all of this matters to us. So of course, PAR publishes um, 60 to 70 articles a year in six issues depending on the length of the article and the page budget. And we receive over 1,200 manuscripts now. Um, last year, we had about 1,200, which is up 100% from when we took over three years ago. Uh, just tremendous increase in submissions. Um, we publish four types of articles. Um, editorials, of course. I start each issue with an editorial where I share both my thoughts on things that are happening in the world and things that are important to the discipline, but also I introduce the issue and, and review some of the pieces that are in it. Um, also, we have editorials that are authored by our guest editors when we have a symposium. Then we have the traditional research articles, which undergo full peer review. If it, if it appears in par as a research article, it's been peer reviewed by three people. We have viewpoint articles, which undergo a I call it a light review. We have uh, two reviewers look at those. Those are intended to be shorter, more concise, practice-oriented articles, uh, with the goal being that if there's something innovative and interesting, we would like to bring it to press more quickly uh, by getting it reviewed quickly and expediting the process. And then, of course, we publish book reviews. And so uh, of the 1,200 manuscripts we received last year, uh, about 1,150 of them were research articles and about 50 were uh, viewpoint submissions. And I don't count book reviews in that, in that number. Those come in separately. Uh, that pattern is continuing this year. Uh, I've already received over 200 manuscripts. Uh, and it's just the middle of March. So, uh, you know, I fully expect to have a, a, a very full roster of manuscripts to consider this year as well. Because of the increased workload, we have to desk reject a lot of manuscripts. And so when they come in, I'm the first person, I'm not the first person that reads them. I have a student who makes sure that there are no technical errors and that the uh, authors remove the identifying information. But after that, I'm the first person that reads them. And so I look at each manuscript myself 
and make a determination about whether or not to send it out for review or assign it to an editor um, to send it out for review. And what am I looking for? You know, I'm looking for something that I think has a, a reasonable chance of being successful in our peer review process. Our peer reviewers know they're reviewing for par. They have very high standards um, and they're very critical. And they let me know when I send them something that shouldn't be reviewed. <laughs> so unfortunately, what that means for me is that I can't send things out for review that have clear weaknesses that would prohibit them from being publishable after a revision. Um, and so how do I do that? I look for the conceptual contribution. I look for the relationship of the piece to the general body of theory in that area. I look for the appeal of the piece to readers beyond the area that it comes from. I look for indicators of reliability, validity, as I mentioned early on. And I look for things that I expect to, to excite readers, things that are likely to be cited, things that are likely to be shared and of interest that would inform future research. So it's not always easy to make those decisions. I will be perfectly honest. Um, that is one of the most gut-wrenching decisions I have to make. But, uh, you know, out of 1,200, I probably just reject 500 uh, pieces myself and then review the remainder. Of the remainder, um, you know, it's 50-50, it's more or less. Uh, rejects and revise and resubmits. And then about 50% of the revise and resubmits are ultimately rejected. So of the total, you know, all being said, we reject somewhere between 92 and 95% of the manuscripts we receive. It's very difficult to get a manuscript in par. Um, and it's not getting any easier. And so one of, the, one of the reasons that we desk reject so much is because PAR is a global journal. And there have been developments around the world that have led to increased readership for us. So we've made a very concerted push. You know, we've always had uh, a very strong readership in China, very strong body of scholars uh, working in China, submitting to PAR um, and other parts of Asia as well. Um, very strong body of scholars and research in Europe and Australia, but the rest of the world has been more or less forgot. And so uh, working with Wiley, our publisher, we've been able to reach institutional libraries in other parts of the world. And by being read, authors are starting to send manuscripts to us. We get uh, a lot of things from uh, the Middle East. We get a lot of things from South America, Latin America now. Uh, we get some things from uh, parts of Asia that we hadn't previously. Um, e even Africa and a couple of things from India uh, come in you know, from time to time. So the, the issue, of course, is that we're getting more pieces, but the quality of the pieces is not consistent over time. So when you have scholars who are working in an environment with, uh, I guess, lower expectations for validity and reliability you know i'm getting a lot of descriptive papers or things that could be book chapters from parts of the world that aren't as well developed so that's contributing to the desk reject rates of course uh, the impact factor is one of the things that we always look at and we try to maintain uh, as, as strong an impact factor as we can at par because that's a value to our authors to the people who publish in the journal and it it um, translates into readership for us. PAR articles are downloaded on average about one and a half million times per year. Uh, of course, you know, we still publish the print issue, but by and large, most of our readership is, uh, is accessing articles through our online um, portal or through library services that subscribe to, to Wiley's offerings and uh, so on and so forth. So, you know, a million and a half is a lot of readership, and that's fueled in large part by the impact factor. Our our five year impact factor is still ranked number one in the field. I think our four our two year impact factor is four point oh three or something like that, which ranks us fourth in the field. Um, we're still number one in Google Scholar, and uh, very proud of of the work that our team has done. 
Um, it's not just me. You know, we have a team of about 30 people, uh, six editors, uh, 10 or so associate editors who represent all of the various subfields, who represent various regions of the world, um, who are, you know, as diverse and representative a group as you could ask for. And of course, a uh, really terrific editorial board. Some of you are, are most likely editorial board members. So, you know, we're very proud of our team. We're very proud of uh, what we do. And it's been difficult during the pandemic. I'll be perfectly honest. It's, um, it's harder and harder to get reviewers. Uh, and we're getting more and more manuscripts. And so uh, we do the very best we can with what we have. So with that, I'll be quiet and happily take your questions.